Hiccups can happen and that's okay. That's all part of the journey. It's about learning. If you don't learn, how are you gonna progress to the next one? There's always something that might happen, but it's okay to keep an open mind and just make sure the numbers are stacking up. You're happy to back commercial product? Yeah, 100%. I always saying that the moment to fear commercial is when rents start dropping. That's your, your gauge. I think this is something that hasn't changed since we started Rethink Investing in general. We believe in what we do. We're not gonna lie when we will tell you as it is, which is really a nice thing. We will advise, we'll help, and we wanna see you succeed at the end of the day. Okay, everyone. Hey, again, Phil Tarrant here. I'm the host of Inside Commercial Property. I'm actually the co-host. I think I've been relegated today because uh, it's a very special uh, edition. I've got two guests uh, in our studio here today. So a bit of a difference to how you might be used to tuning in on the audio on Inside Commercial Property. And for those of you who are tuned in, wherever we are on the internet, YouTube and elsewhere, no doubt across all the social channels, I actually have the founders of Rethink Investing joining me on this very special addition mina and scott o'neill you might know scott we chat every month about all things commercial property but it sounds like today i've got the brains trust this outfit here mina o'neill and we go behind the scenes of how these two have built not only a significant or very substantial commercial property portfolio but have helped over three and a half thousand australians also achieve that three billion dollars in property purchased under the auspices of rethink investing gang hey gang you well yeah, very well. It's good. So I speak to you all the time, Scott. So I'm probably going to give you a little bit less. Well, perfectly. <laughs> cool. I want to know what's going on. You've been hiding Nina from from uh, from us and our listeners for for many many years now. We've been recording uh, this particular podcast. From what I understand, and I've read the book, and here it is here: Rethink Property Investing. This is the second instalment of it. So it's been updated. Uh, myself and Scott. If you go back and tune in a couple of years ago, we broke this book down and went through every single chapter as we. We're in the depths of the COVID pandemic. It's been uh, rewritten, reissued. Uh, life after COVID, markets have changed, interest rates have changed, uh, and a lot around commercial property is changing. So we're going to get to the base of it today, understand what the differences are in the book. You can go get the book. It's in all good book so shops, I'm told. Uh, and also you can get online, rethinkinvesting.com.au. But I want to know what's different, but I know what, want to know what's different with these two as well. So uh, I'm talking to camera right now. For those of you online, you'll see that. But for those of you who are just tuning in, on our usual podcast channel, Rethink Property Investing with Inside Commercial Property. Tune in. Remember, there's hundreds now of other episodes that we've recorded uh, right across this platform. So I hope you do enjoy. You guys have been out and about the last couple of months or so, rethinking what's next for your business. Okay. Mina, I'm reading a book <laughs> that you started off sleeping on a, a mattress in a family home somewhere trying to build out this particular company. Yep. Now there's Rethink pretty much everything. And I personally use Rethink myself for some commercial uh, property purchase and also use your your legal arm. Um, this expansion continues. You must enjoy what you do. Definitely do. And uh, I mean, every day is a new experience, which is why we love doing what we do. You know, um, and every day as we go ahead, you know, there's always new things that happen. Like you said, you know, change in the market, you know, COVID-19, everything's changed as we go forward. There's always new experiences to, I guess, learn from. And at the same time, you know, it's nice to be able to um, I guess, try and enjoy it as well a little bit occasionally here or there. So yeah, it's been very, a very amazing journey. So so frame your philosophy as in what you do. Are you a commercial property investor that also helps other co people invest in commercial property through Rethink or you're a business person first now and the uh, your own personal portfolio is a secondary thing? I think, funny enough, I'd say, I th I'd say my personal portfolio is actually my number one priority now. So I've kind of diverged a lot, which is great. Um, so for myself personally, I, so obviously myself and Scott built, you know, Rethink Investing together. We were, you know, on a mattress on the floor, like you said before, and we decided to, you know, expand. And as we were expanding, you know, we kind of went, well, look, our portfolio is big enough now to operate as a single business as itself. So we kind of did the split in that respect. So he does the Rethink Investing and I do the property portfolio. And it's great because it's a great different challenge can grow it in different ways and you can learn again with every experience that comes along the way so obviously starting in residential and then moving into commercial and now it's based mostly commercial which is very exciting with you know land you know next to properties where you can do developments and there's just a whole bunch of things you can kind of do now that's really cool it's really cool and i don't want to give too much away what's in the book because <laughs> I want to go and buy it. It's, it's a good read. And uh, I've probably got one of the first copies. You haven't signed it yet. So <laughs> I have to sign it before I leave. Um, um, 
So it sounds like you you guys sort of get scale in your relationship and the utility of that. And I'm, I'm saying relationship to the utility, but you you stay in the lane. So you're concentrating on 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 driving, administering, yep. um, uh, you know, ensuring that the personal commercial portfolio continues to grow and deliver, which is very much the the origin journey. And Scott is is driving the rethink uh, business. How, how do you? How did probably a personal question, but I'm allowed to ask this question. How, how did you guys sort of talk business and, and reconcile between we're talking business now and now we're talking family? Is that have you yeah. got a good cadence for that? Funny enough, you say that you know we it, it is it is something we have had to work on, you know, on, in a number of years, you know, and which is why you know when we come home we kind of go okay, work time stop, let's talk about family. We try to switch off, which is great. But at the same time, you know, when it comes to, you know, Scott wanting to know, you know, a few little things that he might go, you know, what's your your opinion on this? I go, well, this is my opinion. But if you don't want to go ahead with it, that's totally fine. So we diverge it, which is really good. And we try to stay in each other, out of each other's lanes too much now, which means we can actually drive each section of what we are doing properly and develop it as we go as well. So we try to keep those separate. Otherwise, I think we'd kill each other. But <laughs> it's good. It's nice to have, you know, you got a bit of fun. And yeah. sometimes, I'm not going to say tension, but, you know, being able to have a, a and I find this, whether it's personal relationships or business relationship, a, a level of respect where you can actually yeah. debate something mm -hmm. without any bias or agenda other than trying to make the best decision. Now, look, and you struggle with that. Yeah. I think particularly commercial property investors um, need to be comfortable with being able to have those discussions, whether it's with their buyer's agent or their mortgage broker or their bank yeah. or whoever it is, right? Um just having that level of maturity and that's how you excel. So, so give me a sense of the portfolio top line again. I don't want to go into too much because mm -hmm. it's all in the book, um, but it's quite a large portfolio. Yeah, it is quite a large portfolio now. I mean, we've got a variety of commercial as well as residential, predominantly with um, commercial at the moment. And there's lots of, you know, areas to fix up. I mean, to be honest, and I'm being completely honest now, about, about a year and a half to two years ago, it was an absolute chaotic portfolio was not managed correctly. It, I didn't know what was happening, where things were flowing, how things were working, which managers were on what, you know, what corrections had to be hap ha happening. Certain things, for example, like, you know, income, P&Ls, all that stuff, nothing was managed. Now it's flowed into making sure that it's not ca not chaotic. So I literally had to sit down. And, so having to have that, you know, divergence and being able to dissect it properly, that's my major, most important, I guess, thing to talk about, I guess, today. So it's went, went from chaos to being a very organized structure today. And I imagine you feel a lot better at that. And, I love and, that. Oh, exactly the same. And issue it, with my portfolio because, you know, oh, I've got to a point where I was bothered. Yeah. More, I'm, I'm sick of it. We're sick yeah. of it Scott. And we just go, I just don't want to deal with it. But fundamentally, it's a good portfolio. So if I neglect it a little bit, mm. it's okay. Yeah. But you get a lot of satisfaction when you do actually regain control. And, yep. and so, you know, I've sold a whole bunch of stuff recently purely because yeah. I'm just sick of having too many properties. Sounds like a real first world exactly. problem, but you know, I know your pain. Yeah. And, and that's the, exactly it, you know. Um, and this is why, you know, at the start when I said to Scott, you know, we need to actually sit down properly and look at this portfolio, see what's working, what's not working. You know, where are we getting good income? Where are we not getting good income? managing it correctly like as if it's a business and actually structuring it in the same way as say for example rethink would operate for our clients that's the same thing in that respect so making sure that you know we've got the right people on the ground so i found that was probably one of the most difficult aspects of managing these properties when you don't have the correct people on the ground to help you understand what's actually going on physically there you know finding out you know why certain you know incomes should be raised high why have things not been raised correctly why haven't the increases gone through all that stuff was actually missed and we actually missed a lot of we didn't budget correctly to be able to know how much you know our commercial property should be earning in reality so sitting down and actually dissecting everything and going okay how are we going to structure this how is it going to be maximum effect of how much income we can get and making sure that we have the right people on the ground to help us make it happen so I actually recently um, had a, a property assistant hired to actually help me do this. So I'm literally looking at it like a business, like a functioning entity producing, you know, having losses, having production of, of income, everything, just to make sure that everything's flowing correctly. You've you, you got to do it. You've got to figure it like a business. And that comes through absolutely in the book. And no doubt when you're working on the rethink side of things with clients, it is 
having the understanding, a lot of people think property is a great investment because yep. you buy it and it just goes up in value and they think it's very passive, but it's not. It's hugely active investment. You've got to be on it and across it all the time because if you don't do that, not only do you find yourself in problems, but you're going to make less money at a P&L level. And most people I know, they might enjoy investing in property, but most people want to make a buck out of it for the purpose of giving choice and time and therefore a comfortable retirement. So what property for you personally, is there a property in your past somewhere you've always been connecting in with it? Is it a motive connection? I could see that. Um, as in an emotional connection to a property? Yeah. So I guess for, a, funny enough, you say that, I don't emotionally connect to them that much. And I'll be completely honest. Some of them I really like to see them develop and become, you know, a really great entity of functionality and making sure the problems that have happened and bad tendencies go out and good tendencies come in. But it's, I actually think that I don't have a connection and that's how I see these properties. They are a, an engine, you know, of, oh, I guess wealth in that respect. And, you know, I treat it like that because I don't want to get that emotional connection too much to it. Like um, my biggest baby would probably be the build that we're doing here now. So that's more of an emotional connection. But, and that's been a completely different journey. Exactly. You know, and it's, you know, knock down, rebuild from scratch, essentially. And it's a completely different ball game to, you know, being able to have a structured feeling and more of a in non-personal feeling to a commercial property because I see it as an income in that respect. So I'm very professional, like a business in that respect. So you're obviously passionate about property. So the, is the passion about the outcome and, and, and what it delivers to you? Is that where, that's what I'm hearing? Yes. Yeah. I like to see the result you know, of such hard work for so long and periods. I mean, you know, when you buy a property, there's always going to be a great property and you can see all, all the, you know, numbers stack up and everything's correctly and, you know, this is the reason why you buy it and this is why you get excited for it at the start. But, you know, along the way, you know, you've also got hiccups here or there, you know, and that's the fun bit, I find, because once you get over those hiccups and you've got, you know, good solutions with good, you know, um, whether you've got good brokers and solicitors and, you know, there's a lot of, different factors along the way of them, like remortgaging them, you know, to make sure certain things are coming out better in your rates or whether it's all that maneuvering around to make. There's a lot to deal with. Yeah. You know, and and uh, you've got to accept if you're investing in property that you're going to get a lot of problems. But yep. it's how you have a philosophy towards resolving problems and yep. it sounds there for. Yep. And also that's what your passion is, is that Definitely. you like to like challenge, a challenge and you like to resolve it. Yep. We've well, sort of got a challenge in Scott here. She, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's quite funny with podcasts that you chat around a lot of relationships. Yeah. I'll leave it. <laughs> and Alan knows well, quite well. But Scott, you you kicked off sort of 23 years old uh, investing in property. That was together. Did you start this property journey? Yeah. We were at the same time. We were together at yeah. the same time. Like it was very early on in the relationship. So um, it was my individual purchase. But like I brought Mina along to that you know, crappy old fibro house on the highway. And <laughs> this is Sutherland, right? Sutherland, yeah. And and I just said, oh, what do you think? And I expected her to say, yeah, this this is hideous, this thing. But um, but it had a granny flat at back and, she, you know, she asked, well, what are the numbers? And it produced about 200, 200 bucks a week net, so 10K a year. And to us at the time, that was like a European holiday free. Mm. You know, it's like, why not? You know, would we buy a unit in the same, you know, suburb and negatively gear it or buy this and have land and you know it doesn't matter what it looks like it's really just the outcome like Mina said and so I knew she got it day one and that's why probably as a relationship we've invested very well because we didn't prioritize the family home until we purchased 20 plus houses so delaying that family home being rent investors was probably key to where we got today like it if we just loaded up with a big principal place of residence loan at the start, we would have been tapped out, you know, half a, you know, half a decade early, which would have made a big difference in the end. So, yeah, investing to the strategy from day one, relent like relentlessly without, um, you know, diverging the path. That that was key, I think. Well, it's not tracing the the typical norm that people think is a journey. They should be on, and you know, still exists in Australia that yeah, supposed to buy a. You know, a house in the suburbs with a one picket fence, right? And yeah, it's it's bucking the trip. But I, I know you come from a family. Um, uh, your parents invested, but you know, in the eighties and probably nineties when everyone was chasing uh, negative cash flow for the purpose of tax. So yeah. it sounds as though, and it comes pretty clear through the book that from that very first property purchase, you're all about positive cash flow rather than 
you know, make it a loss to, to save yourself 30 cents. So thanks, man. Yeah. Well, look, we've seen that, you know, asset rich, cash flow poor situation um, where, you, you know, you can spend your whole life feeling like you're not you know, wealthy at all, but you've got these assets. And it, to me, it seemed a little bit backward. You know, you, you don't want to just live for now. That's, that's a short sighted notion, but you've got to be smart and you can't only live for tomorrow as well. And that strategy, it kind of works back, you know, my parents age groups when, you know, it was five times the average income by the average house. But what are we talking now? Like 14, 15 times. Right. You don't negatively gear that. If you do that, you've got a death sentence with debt. So, you know, you've got to invest differently, especially people in, you know, starting out now, like, you know, the next generation, you, you almost have to give up in some circumstances with that family home. And you've got to then, you know, go down to this more affordable way of investing, which, you know, by default will give you better cash flow. So it's kind of win-win. It gets you in earlier in a better cash flow situation. And, you know, rather than, uh, you know, just giving up on property ownership. Mm. Uh, it's, it's really funny how you frame it because uh, there's still an entitlement in Australia that everyone should be able to afford and own their own house, right? And, and let's be clear, it is available to most Australians. You might not necessarily be able to do it in Sydney and Melbourne, right? So it's a mindset shift. Um, but a lot of people think that they have to compromise that dream by going down a pathway that, that you spoke about. Did you guys think that you had to give up anything in order to to sort of build out this portfolio. You said, you know, you didn't have the family home, probably wouldn't want it, but you know, my view is the opposite. I, I call it strategic patience, you know. Yeah. You, you, you spend that time investing smartly when you can, probably without some of the trappings of responsibility that you have when you get a little bit older. Yeah. Your family home's probably your better one at the end of the game. For sure. But we gave up on lifestyle. Like we were, I was chasing whatever job paid better, you know, whether it was in, uh, you know, an hour and a half away from Sydney and I drove every day, six day a week jobs. Um, we moved to Port Macquarie for years, you know, I mean, I had to leave her job. We left family and friends just because that job paid 30 grand more type of thing. So that it was a means to an end and we were squirreling away every bit we could into property. So we were redlining. Like, yes, it say, but was it you? Was it me? Who was sort of there going? I think I'm a bit more. I don't know. I think, to be honest, I think we're pretty even in that respect. I've always, I mean, my family background, you know, with my dad and both my mum and my dad, we're not the most wealthiest families at all. You know, my dad lived in one room, you know, um, with 12 siblings. So a big family. And, you know, they always were savers. They're like, they used to call them little ants, you know, to save, save, save and make sure that you have something for your future. So I guess that notion has always been in me. And even till today. So do you think, you know, this journey that you've been on together with property and also with business, have, have you had to change your mindsets along the way um, or are you largely the same but you're just executing it differently? And, that, and that's both in the business and your personal lives. So how has that evolved? But Well, I guess, for, and, you know, if I could speak for personal lives, you know, as you, I think, you know, everyone changes what they want as a goal set as they as they get older, you know. So your your priorities change and things diverge a bit and you want different things and, and as the market changes around you and your situational you know, surroundings change, that makes a makes it a huge influence on what you want future wise as well. I mean, you know, originally when we first started, I really wanted, you know, the freedom of travel. You know, and that's, you know, to gain that time back for myself because, you know, I had a background of seeing my mum not being able to do any of that because she was always so sick and she just wanted time and life to live and enjoy. So I learned from that a lot. So for me at the starting point, that's personally for our personal life, that's why investing was important to me. And I said to myself, you know, if I can see the income and, and what happens after all the expenses are taken out and what I've got to live off. I can replace an income one day that's perfect because that's what I want to do to gain my time back with family and friends that I actually want to spend time with and I guess as you get older you know things change you know you, you want your family home you know you want to be able to have quality time with people yet again around you but you know now it's also my daughter so I want to you know have that you know understanding of you know value for money and be able to teach her and have the time to teach her there so as things evolve it's just you know comfortability later on you know and now it's more so enjoying what you do. So I enjoy what I do now, you know, and want to open up a computer, not, you know, have to open up a computer now, which is a real, something really special, I think, about something that. Nice. Yeah. Nice about that. And, yeah. And 
you know, most, I, I know a lot of property investors, I know a lot of property investors, very large portfolios, and, you know, once they get on that train, they they continue to evolve and their, uh, their vision gets a lot more expansive. Yeah. And you talk about mindset shifts in the book, Scott, uh, it says that you were essentially, I think you guys were in Greece and uh, you could retire. And you sort of sat there and went, hang on, this is, this is really what, what we want. Um, how, you know, do, 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 you, do you still have those inflection points where now you've created so much more and you probably could stop and smell roses and, you know, spend your time on the beach? Um, but you obviously get something really connected in with the, the growth of the rethink business and, you know, when's yeah. enough enough, mate? Well, look, even three hours on that beach, I'm on board yeah. as well. So it's like, what's next? And I'm like, you know, because we're in Greece for three and months. And you see, these are highly successful people. Yeah. They get, they get to where they want to go and they go, what next? Yes. This is why um, well, people always ask me, when are you retiring? I'm like, I'm never going to retire. I'm yeah. going to be doing something. Yeah. I have to. It's just, for sure. It's it in, you know, to, to me, so like, yeah. psychologically. So. Yeah, look, it's been almost since the start we started rethink because we were in a good financial position back then and rethink was almost a, a hobby on the side so the two initial things were number one to stay just connected to the market wanted to understand and and second was just like the thrill of the deal like you know negotiating properties and it didn't matter if it was for me or for a client or for a friend it was it's all the same so that I, and that's why i'm still so like hands-on with the business you know negotiating multiple deals per day for clients and I actually prefer it now for clients than myself because it when it's for myself it's like you know it's then got to be there's all that back work you got to do to own it and uh, you know all that stuff but now it's really um it's about the business and the brand that's that's what gets me out of bed in the morning we're just really there to I don't know leave a legacy now and um you know, it's got nothing to do with P&Ls anymore. It's really to do with how many people can we influence to consider what we think is a better asset class. And we feel like we're sort of the first people properly doing this in the country, like bringing commercial property to the mums and dads of Australia. And, you know, there's plenty of fund managers buying towers in the city, but there's really not what not many people there helping everyday people buy good commercial investments. Because uh, I know when we started, there was no books out there. You know, I remember Googling what to do and all I got was American articles. You know, there's, so it's, it's an early sort of, you know, you know, we're disruptors in the industry a little bit. So I think that's kind of what we want to keep flowing through and yeah, that's what's exciting. So, yeah. And, and you yeah, know, I completely agree with you. And I know one of the catalysts of us creating this podcast was how do you educate Australian investors around yeah. alternatives to residential property? It's where we started. Uh, we've been doing this now for, for well over two years and yeah. no, no, it will continue a bit. I think just by, you know, having this mechanism of, of education and influence, how many more people now consider commercial property investing? And it comes really clear through the book that you've got a passion for educating Australians around commercial property for the next, I think you said, a couple of decades or something. Yeah. You, you care. But like, why do you care so much? Oh, honestly, just the great results. So we, we build really good connections with our clients. So our clients are, you know, lifelong. And, uh, and that's for all the people that work with us. We had a meeting yesterday with our staff and just talking like what's the why of the business and it, it's to build lifelong relationships and and with that you it's got to be built on trust it's got to be built on results it's got to be built on good service it's you know that's what we're striving to as a business and and that's how you know we will then grow to that next level brand you know that you know we, we don't want to be viewed as just buyers agents we want to be viewed as kind of like you know up there with one of the best brands in the country and um I think we're we've got the right product. You know, we're, we're gifted commercial property. When you do it right, it you know the results speak for itself. So we're got to do something different, and that's you know all of the above. And um, and I, I know with my clients, you know, many of them work for us now. You know, some they're fully retired. Their lives have been changed. Some of them were wealthy to start with, and they've just now got comfortability that their money's parked in a good asset. Yeah. So there's all different levels, from entry level to the guys that have, you know, got multi, you know, you know, eight figure portfolios. It's it doesn't matter. It's all the same to us. So yeah, it's uh, exciting, and that's what we'll, like I said, keep doing for decades. Yeah, and the the proof of putting is there. You have a, a large portfolio, um, which transition from being residential heavy to commercially heavy, um, which, which is great. Uh, can you do that today though? Uh, it's a very different market. It's a very different lending environment. Uh, it, it's great that you're, you're expanding 
uh, mindset towards education, towards commercial property, and more Australian investors uh, considering as a gateway for, for wealth creation. Can you emulate what you've done in this market? Yeah, 100%. Um, if anything, it'll be comparably easier in commercial than residential because the yields have just got squeezed so much more in residential. The yields are still good in commercial. So we've, since you know, 2018, when APRA changed lending rules, residential, I think, large portfolios, it did stop at that point. You can still build a big residential portfolio. We all know that, but it's a lot harder. You've got to set up different entities. It costs more. You've got to put more equity in. Like It's not just that kind of rinse and repeat dump equity scenario that many pre-2018 did very well off. Um, and it's also a, a house of cards situation. If you just build debt on debt on debt without the income covering enough, you know, enough multiples of the debt, you know, if something goes wrong or there's a change in the economy, um, yeah, people get unstuck. And higher interest rates are a good example. There's a lot of stock starting to hit the market because people are hurting. Commercial investors, um, you know, if you look at what Ray White produced uh, a report, they're saying. On the insto level, stock is 70% down. So when the economy hurts, those wealthy individuals basically just hold property because they've got all these other assets they can flog off or they've got large you know, you know, equity piles that they don't, they don't need to be forced to sell. They'll just hold and wait for the rainy day to pass. Um, but residential, you, you can get caught out if you're doing 90% loans and p- pulling equity out. So It's okay to start that way, but not necessarily where you want to end. Exactly. And, and that's how I still think most young Australians should start. Like that 90% loan, although it's high risk, is brilliant for return on equity. But just don't stick at that strategy. I see hundreds of buyers agents out there all telling you to buy 10 plus residential houses. Why do they say that? From a business point of view, it means more commission. You know, that's buying many, many houses. So calling out the industry, that's, that's why they do it. You know, do they tell you to build a sustainable portfolio? You know, where you should be building income high enough, maybe buy less properties, but higher value ones with better income. No, because it doesn't suit their business model. So it's a bit cooler than it. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit biased. But um, but yeah, look, we, we were in that position where we saw clients go, I want another property. And you can get into the habit of just going and buying, you know, 10 houses. I had clients buy 10 houses through me when we were more residential back in 2014, 15, 16. It worked back then because you could get your six and a half percent net yields in capital cities, but uh, and interest rates weren't as high as they are today. But you don't follow that strategy anymore. You've got to adapt with the market, and it's a very different market now. Commercial may not be perfect in ten years. We don't know, but for now it is. We will adapt if commercial is not suitable as well. We're not going to blindly stick to this, you know, this agenda if it doesn't work. But mm. for now, mathematically, it works. The banks are still flexible. You can still buy good commercial properties, you know, under a million dollars in in all parts of the country, nearly. Um, I can so see, well, I can see the engineer's mind come <laughs> loud and clear there. But uh, again, back to your portfolio, I know you 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 both started off pretty heavy in uh, in resi. You bought a lot of apartment blocks, which which are yeah, great investments. These are back in the days when you're getting higher yields. Those yields have come off, so you made that that pivot, that transition yourself into yeah commercial property. And that's the focus, but the, the same applies inside a rethink investing you started off largely supporting people on residential sales purpose uh, uh, purchases can you tell me that inflection point do you remember the conversations media where you said no nah, the game is commercial for this business yeah well um i guess i don't know i guess for me it was more you know i think commercial is a game changer for us at least you know we for myself for example you know diverging into that number one it's a bigger challenge Number two, it's more, you know, I find it's, you know, yes, big risk in that respect, but it's it's more security, longer tenancies, you know, um, not as much diddly-dallying compared to our residential portfolio. So it was a lot easier to manage to just buy it, leave it, forget it. And that's exactly what I wanted at the time. And still now, I guess. So. Still there. Yeah. And, and, and commercial, did you any resident at all? Yeah. So usually you, you got commercial. So as I said, resi is really good for the guys just starting out they might have less than a hundred thousand deposit you know she'll go get an 85 90 percent loan and stretch your money like the power of leverage is the reason real estate works so well in this country you know without leverage you wouldn't touch residential or you know even commercial would be less attractive here just stick it in bonds for no risk but you can leverage 
and these assets all grow over time. And like we've got some really interesting stats in the book where we've actually basically looked up the square meter rates of um, the types of buildings you buy in both industrial, retail, office, and compared the same square meter rates till today. And they're all growing around sort of five, six percent per annum. And if you look over that same time period, residential's like high six percent. So it's almost the same growth. So, you know, if you're getting six, seven percent growth long term, that's pretty good result for any asset if you leverage. So we do resi, but we definitely set them on a path to get to commercial. So So why is it resi being a mechanism or a utility to get to yeah to the prize, which is commercial yeah. property? And and I read in the book um uh, your stats sort of uh, post GFC and, and post COVID, uh, what Australians need to remember, and, and this is not a sort of stocks versus shares type thing, but uh, you saw uh, how the ASX 200 come off during those periods of time. And you look at property, what people need to remember about property, if you're choosing property as an asset class, so you had two powerful partners when it comes to, to property investing. Number one is, is leverage, which means banks are happy to have a bit of skin in the game because it's how they make their money. Uh, that's the value of their balance sheet. So they're happy to invest or co-invest with Australians in property. And number two is the government. Uh, the government structurally uh, wants Australians, Australian mum and dad investors largely, to be providing um, property for rent. Uh, that's the way we're, we're geared. That's where we're built. We've gotten sort of build to rent type schemes coming in right now, but 90 plus percent of all um, rental stock is still owned by Australian mum and dad investors. So they're two big friends they have on your side. If you get it right, uh, they're going to stick around. Exactly. And that's why I was, you, you know, I know we all have a bit of a laugh when the latest doomsday merch comes out of the US saying, oh, it's going to crash 50%. What they fail to predict in their models is the government will always do something last minute to try to protect it. So no matter how bad things look, they will not let it fail. You know, it's all too big to fail circumstance because everyone will be worse off if property fails in Australia, even if they don't own one. Um, the rental market will get tighter. The you know, they're basically going to have to put more people on pensions and all sorts of stuff. You go on for 10 minutes in that department, but property needs to succeed in Australia and uh, they'll do what they can to keep going, you know, and more immigration, you know, and they're not building enough. So I'm quite bullish over the next five years, like for both commercial and residential, like there's not enough building going on in this country. There's, there's just uh, a lot of money flowing into this country too. Um, Bill costs have gone up, so just the supply, like existing socks is going to be worth more money. Just has to. And this is the fuel for, for the Australian economy and, and therefore Australian business. We spoke about it for, for years that, you know, commercial property is a game that, of the economy, it's a game of business. So you want business to be thriving and succeed in Australia, fueled by immigration growth, fueled by, you know, Australia being an attractive place to live. And we have our problems and challenges. We only saw um, only recently a new premier in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in, in Melbourne or Victoria. Uh, and the first thing they said was, we need to sort out the housing, the housing problems now. You know, the state governments have skin in the game also. They, they generate quite a lot of money through housing transactions, whether it was uh, state duty or it's uh, land tax. So everyone's in there. Everyone's yep. in there. However, you know, discussion around commercial property, what advice would you give me to have someone kicking out, kicking off in, in their property investing journey with uh, maybe an eye towards being a commercial investor? Um, I guess um, don't be afraid in that respect. But also know that it's not going to be a breeze either. So expect that, you know, hiccups can happen and that's okay. That's all part of the journey. It's about learning. You know, if you, if you don't learn, how are you going to progress to the next one? There's always something that might happen, but it's okay to keep an open mind and just make sure the numbers are stacking up. You just got started off again. What would you do different? Just don't fear it, you know, understand it. Like that, that's the old, um, you know, most people that don't invest, they just because it's, you know, those myths, oh, it doesn't grow, or oh, the vacancies are forever going to be long. Um, they just see it as risk. And I did as, as well when I first looked at it. You just got to get educated, hence why we release things like this book. It's it's just to show it's not the it's not the thing to fear. If you understand it, you can kind of maneuver around the risks. Um, I, don't, I actually view it as lower risk because I understand it. Yeah. I think more than residential these days, there's a lot more stuff out of your control or residential like market sentiment of that but commercial you can see the numbers like to the decimal point what it should be running for and you know what the you know what what inbuilt rental growth you've got on it so it's it's a lot more spreadsheet driven so uh, as long as it's not a, an area with a heap of vacancies probably okay 
So, so with Smash probably being so intrinsically connected with with the economic sort of fortunes of Australia, do you obsess over, you know, the, the papers every morning looking at CPI data and job rates and like does does he do this? Yeah, <laughs> he does. The old hall. <laughs> every two seconds of the day, I am surprised <laughs> he sleeps. <laughs> Oh, but I reckon he's probably not with Clark, but I'm going to him. Uh, I like, it. yeah, even going like different countries. I go, oh, I wonder what they're doing. What's what's the economy happening there? Like just to understand the different problems, but it's all related. And yeah, like it's a lot more interesting than reading like, you know, current affairs, like, you know, what's going on with two neighbours and, you know, all that garbage on the news. Like but this this is the real world, in my opinion. So you actually like it, like you, you get yeah. it. Because you, if you understand the economy, you can kind of see into the future a little bit. Depend, like depending on what how deep you go, like you can at least predict the next six months quite accurately. I think. And you have a large or sure, bullish confidence level then on, despite some of the challenges sort of facing the economy. Which yeah, yeah, too much for this podcast. But you're, you're happy to back commercial property. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I always say in the the moment to fear commercial is when rents start dropping. Yeah. That's your, your gauge. So, you know, and, and we'll hopefully be doing this podcast when that happens and we'll be saying, all right, well, this this is a time to sit back. And, uh, like it's probably happening in the office market right now. Like vacancy rates are probably over, uh, they're up, up 15 odd percent. I've seen some pretty alarming reports coming in, yeah. but that's just the nature of the game. Yeah. And what's going to happen in that market is it's going to drop in value to the point it's equal to residential. And then they're going to start filling it up with people. Uh, but there's got to be probably a 20, 25, 30% price correction before that happens. So towers aren't going to be useless. They're just going to change their usage. And a lot of them won't be suitable and you have to spend a lot of money on it. And that means more loss for the current owner. Um, so yeah, there's different sectors of the economy, but um, yeah, you don't always buy. But I think, you know, potentially rate drops next year, bill costs have gone up, you know, you developers can't make much money these days so if you're buying existing stock the the pipeline ahead of you in terms of the supply point of view is quite weak and that's good because mm. less supply means less competition and um yeah for that reason i'm quite confident yeah and you, you have the turn and a lot of people well most people are investing probably because they they're chasing some sort of choice or retirement or whatever that looks like everyone has their own version of it yep. and i think when people get there as you've done you sort of go well maybe there's a little bit more lit in the tank but mm. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a big fan of the terms like financial independence, financial freedom. It seems to be the sort of stuff that gets peddled on TikTok with people that probably shouldn't be providing advice. But I, I know putting your clients down a pathway for giving them that choice and that option, whatever that version is of it for them, is a big driver for how you approach your your clients. Uh, Mina, is yeah. is is that the point of satisfaction and and passion? Also, is like, do you like seeing people who have like. You know, you change stuff for them. Yeah, and look, and this is the thing. I think this is something that hasn't changed since we started Rethink Investing in general. You know, we believe in what we do. You know, we, we're not going to lie. When We will tell you as it is, which is really a nice thing. We will advise, we'll help, and we want to see you succeed at the end of the day. You know, because if I, I wouldn't recommend something to some, or a commercial property to someone, unless I physically haven't, wouldn't buy it myself. I would never put someone in that position. So seeing that satisfaction in people trying to achieve that, those goals, whatever it may be, um, is great. It's fantastic. It's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Yeah. And how do people normally thank you if you've done a good job? I don't know. Do they? Uh, do they just expect <laughs> they just expect No, no, they're, they're very grateful. Like most of them yeah. are quite private, uh, especially the more wealthy ones. They, they hide, hide everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like between us, we've got really good conversations. You've become connected to them for life as well as, you know, a lot of them. So it's not just, you know, getting a Google review here or there. Like you, you are getting probably that loyalty from them as a client. So most of our clients would buy, you know, on average, probably three properties. And, and that's in our current lifespan. So the business will age in time. So they'll end up buying more properties. So we're not once off, you know, transactions and because that doesn't really suit us as a business, you know, with all the marketing and the costs and that, just to do one sale with a client, it's, and then you've got to build the trust at the start. Like that's not really as fun as, as a return client coming back and then they know how the previous one went. So my greatest satisfaction is like that next and the third and the fourth property. And some of the clients have been with us since my 
you know, Cinderella days from the very beginning. So do you think you'll you'll get to a point you're going to stick with this so you get generational clients where, you know, mum and dad introduce the kids saying, come on, it's time to start. Yeah. Have seen that yet? Yeah, well, it's a lot of it's gone the other way where the kids have signed up, bought a property, and then the, the dad's caught wind of it, or the mum or the uncle. What are you up to? Yeah. <laughs> and then, then they come in, so... Uh, yeah, it definitely goes both ways, which which is a good sign of trust. And and thinking about your your business as a commercial uh, operation, uh, you, you would have your challenges in that, uh, and you know the the attitude or awareness towards commercial property is accelerating. I think this podcast, in many ways, has helped shape a lot of people's opinion. That goes to your point around education. But if more people sort of are looking for really good commercial assets, we've spoken about this a lot. There's not a lot of really good commercial assets out there, so make sure job a lot harder, a yep. lot harder. How do you sort of, how do you, how do you rationalise that? Well, it is the limiting factor for our business growth. So we could generate more clients, and that just creates a longer waiting list. And um, we're limited by the quality of properties. So I think there's about seventeen, eighteen odd thousand transactions per year in the commercial space. Like it's in the book, um, the exact numbers, but residentials five fifty to six hundred thousand. So that's why the residential space is more well known. There's more buyers agents, there's more sales agents. Everyone knows about it, understands it. Commercial is niche and it's smaller. And a lot of those assets are worth 50 million plus as well. So there's only a small segment of that market, which is even within reach and probably 90, 90% of it's junk, you know, it's overpriced or it's a vacant sale or the building was, you know, at the end of its useful life. So we're really painstakingly sifting through it and that's the buyer's agency's service like we we review probably three four hundred properties per week and out of that you're buying probably five six six of them for clients so yeah not many really make it through it so do you know when you see one straight off the bat you go yeah this one this is worth digging yeah. into a lot more straight away like get a pretty good filter yeah you within five seconds of looking oh like you see the yield the look there's always a bit of, you know, as unemotional as you can be, you know, uh, an ugly property will always struggle to, you know, capture the imagination of someone wanting to own it. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, straight up if it's a good deal or not. But then there's booby traps in it as well. And that's the whole point of our due diligence team. They go and call the tenant, check the square meter rates, look into the legalities of the floor space and the... I've seen it, it gets very grey and yeah. you need to be very... If you don't know what you're looking for... Uh, you, you can overlook quite a lot. So now that's what your team does is to yeah. look under every single corner. So tell me about the book. Did you enjoy re not it's not really a rewrite, it's it's updating it. How who did it? How did you do it? Was it sort of at night over a couple of wines and you sit there and work together on that top facing each other? So tell us about it. I guess um, you know, I'd I'd probably say it was over a couple of wines, yes, definitely. No, but it was it was really interesting. I mean we just read through the whole book. We went through the logistics of what's changed as well and and the commercial part of it as well. So we put a lot more examples in there, a lot more details in regards to, you know, the analysis of it, how to manage them. There's a whole lot of extra detail there that wasn't there before, which is great. And, you know, things that apply now that we kind of go, oh, no, that does, that's not right, you know, and we rejigged it in that respect, in that way. But it was it was really great doing it. Yeah, I definitely did. It was really nice. Not as much, just because my, <laughs> my attention span was really like... You're worrying about the next deal probably. Yeah, I think if I had nothing else to do, it'd be more enjoyable. But yeah, like you, I'm so busy every day. It's like, how do you find that extra hour? And then when it's spread out, the real trick is to remember what you wrote mm-hmm. and what differentiate what was in an email to a client or what's in the book, like where's the information? So yeah, it was tricky and... Um, Every page we wanted a bit of value in it too. Like the first book, the reason I reread it, the main reason is I felt that the first one was a bit rushed. So we did it right at the end of COVID. And um, I don't know, the business has matured a lot since then too. So it didn't reflect the quality of the business. And, you know, it was a great entry, like the tens of thousands of copies were sold, but I just wanted a, something a little bit more like evergreen. So this one talks about higher interest rates. It goes into the impact of COVID, like the percentage of, you know, drops in values and compare it to shares and resi property. Um, There's just more detail, a little bit more um, science in the book, which which is useful when someone's spending potentially millions of dollars on property. So 
Um, yeah, it's it's the end book. We're not going to probably do another one, but I don't think. He'll tell me it's a, it's a bestseller, um, and, and you'll know the difference with this one because it's got a yellow top on top of it, so you can actually go and find it all over the place, um, no doubt in the airports and, and elsewhere and online. Um, so that's it. No more books. This is it. There's not going to be a third edition. But you speak about maturity. We spoke about mindset before. How how different do you both think about commercial property today than what you did even two, three years ago during the COVID pandemic? I'm just a lot more confident again. Like it's just more thousands of hours into it. So, you know, we went through COVID firsthand. Like we had, we saw, you know, we had 45 contracts under um, the book mentions and then 16 of them ended up getting through to settlement. And those 16 clients that stuck through it made millions of dollars because they got rapid capital growth out of it. So we've really experienced how much capital growth commercial gives you. So that that's a new thing because mm. we were still going off the, the old mindset that it grows much slower. And good good yield, but misnomer. It yeah. Grow. And I honestly thought that three, four years ago, because if you try Google commercial growth, you don't get anything. You'll see some recent reports from like the major colliers jll's you know knight franks of the world but that data stops um you know in the mid 2000s it doesn't really go back yeah. far you can't get this stuff so but it's so niche to your point there's less than twenty thousand yeah commercial real estate transactions so you don't have businesses like real estate.com but you really focusing on it because there's no money in it. it's half a million resi ones so they're gonna go elsewhere but do you have any um sort of trends for the future uh for commercial real estate is going to be more of the same or do you think there'll be different opportunities emerging over time? So the big trend I think is going to be demand for supply. So what that that's why I bring up that amount of people buying residential versus commercial. Like even if 20,000 residential investors come over, you've effectively doubled the demand versus supply ratio. So I think there's going to be a trend long term of lower yields. So that means cap rates are going to compress because more people want this and there's not enough of it worth buying. And relative to, to residential, it's still two to three times better net yields. So why wouldn't you buy it? I think that gap will close. It's too, too different, especially when growth rates are the same. So um, that means above average capital growth as long as the economy is doing okay. So it's supply and demand. There's going to be more people wanting good commercial assets, which will therefore positive yet on prices, but... In line with that, it's going to drive down yields. Yeah, and the the key word is good commercial assets. Like, so this is a general comment. Like, office is not in flavour at the moment. There are some great office investments, like some regional cities, freehold type properties. Yeah, go for it. But again, it's the supply rate. You know, supply demand ratios have to be fine. Like, you know, that's the most basic economic equation. Like, you know, price is dictated by those supply demand ratios. So. You just got to go where that demand will outstrip supply. Right now, it looks like industrial, you know, central retail, you know, anything freehold in a capital city or a major regional center is going to hold its value. Like, there's a lot of gold out there and a lot of risk as well if you're sort of buying in small towns that are getting bypassed by highways or, you know, if if you're uh, in a flood zone and it's getting worse, like, you know, th- these are risks, but that, that'll apply to any asset. Sounds like you and your thing have you work kind of and for you Mina in terms of you know future opportunities for for the portfolio you manage your portfolio do you, do you think that's going to change much how, how you um evolving wise I think I've actually gotten to a stage where you know at this stage I'm looking to you know potentially evolve into more commercials or more intrinsic different ones you know or even to, to be honest um you know development you know next to it you know, next to one that you may have purchased, what's around there? What can you do there? Can you build something extra to accommodate and I guess give you a better income and, you know, better growth in general for the properties you already have existing? How can you benefit yourself more? How can it benefit by making it better in that respect? So, you know, building is is a very interesting part of it. I think, you know, helping it grow in that respect is a very interesting part of it. But also, you know, maybe, you know, eventually over time getting rid of those commercial those re- residential ones excuse me and putting that into more commercial and various parts of australia not just one bucket so it's never ending i think roller coaster which is really nice how do you know what to yeah. focus on at any given time because you, you're thinking forward to the future and where those mm-hmm. options are versus you know the day-to-day mm-hmm. mundane sometimes yeah. 
onerous administration mm-hmm. connected with with the portfolio. How do you, how do you how do you sort of balance that? I guess I mean that's why I guess as mentioned earlier on, you know, the chaos of a year and a half ago to now is a massive difference. So you know there are a lot of spreadsheets involved. There's a lot of mundane day to day you know admin stuff that you have to do got good relationships now with a lot of, you know, different parties that have accommodated, you know, whether it's lending and, you know, our, you know, solicitors and, you know, the people on the ground and, you know, taking care of those properties. But moving forward, you know, just opening up to more horizons and being able to, I guess, bigger things with it. How can we maximize, you know, what we have? What can we do to accommodate, you know, I guess the best outcome for those properties and it may be that you know this one in particular it's as much as it will be growing in this particular time maybe we utilize it for something larger later and just diverging that way over time so it's ever growing i wouldn't stay, say i'd stop it's not static definitely not how are you finding lending at the moment the banks still happy to invest they do it's hard i'm not going to say it's easy but it's very interesting you know once again if you have a good group of people that have knowledge behind them as well and know what they're doing you can definitely, you know, and this is a part of my day-to-day job, you know, looking at the whole portfolio as a whole. What have we got in every section of every investment that we have? Can we refinance? Do do we want to refinance? What can we pull out from one to put into another? So all that jingling around. Is, and we and we trust them, which is great. You know, that personal relationship makes a huge difference. And and in terms of locations, whether it's it's your personal portfolio or, the, or the, that for your clients, um, any any. Any sort of specific regions or locations? I, I know you you're comfortable operating outside of the capital cities when it makes sense. Yeah, so it's all about sort of where the value is, and uh, it can it starts down in the rent value. I think so. If you can see there's uh, you know affordable rents for certain areas versus others, that's where there's potential more upside, and the upside and the rents will obviously flow through into capital value in time. So. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of good areas, and especially with these interest rates being higher, it's made those lower yielding markets they've got punished more. So there's less opportunity there. But ones with six percent or better net yields, they're still in demand, like as hard as you know, as much as ever. So um, all capital cities are on the cards um, within reason. It's just got to be at least you know five and a half, six percent net yield, and because then obviously you're covering your bases with debt. You know, if you're up 30% debt, at least, sorry, 70% debt, you, you'll still be positively geared. And, and yeah, like, so we're, we're like, full disclosure, we're very busy in places like Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, uh, Hobart, Ponsesson, um, regional Victoria is great with 50% stamp duties. Um, the major regional cities as well, that, like, we're kind of active everywhere. It's, Again, it's just going to make sense from a from a yield point of view. Number one, and that gets us in the market. And number two, it's got to be you know the fundamentals need to be right. Like, does that supply demand ratio make sense? Not just now, but like in the future. So you've got to look into what DA's potentials there are, and uh, you just get comfortable in that way. Well, it comes clear, clearly through the book. You know, when you talk about your backyard being all over straight, so you're not a hamstrung to any particular suburb or location. You're a little yeah. church when it comes to the numbers stack up and, and the long-term um, uh, fundamentals of the property stack up, it's, it's worth investing in. So it sounds like you're not stopping at any point soon in, in the portfolio or, or the business. Give me a, a vision or a view to, to 10 years from today, Lena. Um, Maybe another 10, no. <laughs> but more if possible, you know, and maybe diverging into, you know, different areas that we haven't currently stayed in. You know, we've, we've got, like Scott mentioned, Brisbane and, you know, the Queensland area is kind of where we have a lot. And I, I don't like to have all my investments in one section. And we don't currently. But it'd be nice to get a few more in those other sections that we might not have as many. So yeah. definitely don't imagine that way. Asset class-wise, I know you're sort of in chemists and mm-hmm. fast food outlets and yep. uh, uh, medical type of yep. investments. Again, you're whatever's relevant, whatever makes them one inch. Exactly. Definitely. And that's the thing. I wouldn't... At the end of the day, if if I, if, I, if we find an investment, yeah, the, stack, the numbers stack up, you know, um, the yield's great, you know. It depends on the tendencies as well, of course. You know, I, we wouldn't go for anything and anything, even if it's, you know, perfect, yes. But, you know, ultimately, yes, you know, those fast food joints are something I would go for, I would personally look at. 
you know, having an LD currently and we've got, you know, a KFC, uh, sorry, um, yeah, we've got KFC, we've got a few different kind of those food outlet stores, Kemp's Warehouse, you know, yeah. those are really good quality. And for the business, <laughs> I know there's, there's Rethink, um, well, there's a number of different Rethinks these days, including yeah. legal capability and education capability. Is 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 that as wide as you're going to get, Scott, with, with the business and go deeper or you can miss some, oh, I'm all rethinking somewhere. Probably not. I think there's like six different rethinks now. So um, we're going through. You love it. Rethink. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's the the key. We want to make all of them as equally strong. You know, like so, you know, we don't want little baby businesses and like, and what's the point? So we want to build them all up so they're kind of, you know, really improving that rethink ecosystem. You know, that trust, the good service. Um, it's a vertically integrated model where it benefits those who have invested you know, and supports them. So, you know, once you're in that, like that one-stop shop type thing, you can, you can do really good things for the client. And my sort of 10 year goals is to get into things like, you know, I really enjoy getting into the renewables. Like it's very early on, like after the last podcast, we had hundreds of people reach out. So apologize. What was solar? Well. Solar my re- yeah. yeah. Cause we're getting into like EV charging stations and battery storage. Like that's, that could go anywhere, that business. So. Uh, and that's exciting because I've done property for 10 years now. Like there's not much more I feel like we could do. Um, so yeah, just keeping it different, but it still supports commercial investors and resi investors for that matter. So, and yeah, for me, it's about building the brand, you know, rethink investing, rethink, you know, is, is what's important. And, um, I think about that a lot more than my own portfolio with, with Mina, like, and that's why we work. It sounds like you wrong. You know, yep. you, you, you're saying your lanes and yep. it's obviously closely connected. Do you think you'll always be doing something? You could easily now just sort of say, yep. yeah, that's enough. I'll, I'll retire into a nice big fat commercial property portfolio and, and, and take it easy. You'll always be doing, I reckon it would <laughs> last a month and then I'd be like, all right, now what? Cause what else are you going to do? Watch TV and play golf all, yeah. all the time for oil go surfing yeah. some guy <laughs> yeah where it gets yeah like surfing's an hour or so a day max you know what else and but no you're um it's just it's the game of business which which i enjoy it like i was always comfortable with business as a young kid and under like always comfortable looking at big numbers and taking what others would view as big risks uh and i like that so i'll probably just keep doing that forever sounds pretty good yeah. well, you don't have to stop right you know and again it comes down to um, uh, you set yourself on a, a pathway for, for financial freedom, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Uh, it just gives you options and choice. And if that choice is to continue to operate in income generating environments, that's yeah. okay. Exactly. It's okay. It's good. So the book, where can you get it? Where's the best place? What would you rather? Bookshop sales? Can you get it online? Is it is it available from your website? Yeah. So there's a little dedicated page on the website. So rethinkinvesting.com dot au but um yeah all good bookstores have it uh we just got notified they're going to put it all in the airports which is that's a big win for books good later yeah yep. people but, are, are, you know, are on a plane a lot and people still people like property yeah blurry, you know i reckon it's the only spot i've bought a book from right <laughs> i don't know because you're waiting for a plane and you've got nothing to do so <laughs> yeah fair enough. see what's in the book section but yeah so um yeah it should be on all shelves from now okay that's good. Well, it's nice. This is probably one of the first copies, I'll imagine. So yeah. you can just see it right here. Uh, go and check it out. And uh, I think I've done a pretty good job not giving too much away. I think so. Yeah. I think we're doing pretty good. We've been stressed in there. She's going on it. But um, uh, Mina and Scott O'Neill, thanks for your time today. I really enjoy it. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you very much for having me, honestly. <laughs> I can see how this works. It's, uh, uh, you've Thank got something you. going on. And, uh, you know, your success, um, not only building your own portfolio, but but being able to build a, a business which is supporting other Australians to hopefully emulate that same journey and give them that choice is, is something which you must find quite satisfying. So, yeah, well done. Thank Should you very much. Thanks for doing it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be back um, again next month. We'll probably get into more of the nitty gritty stuff. Scott, back to the usual stuff. Back to the usual stuff. Yeah. Have you got any questions or we're happy to cover anything at all around commercial property. I'm not the expert. This guy is and, and, and so is Mina. Um, we're happy to, to cover anything. What's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Just Google Rethink Investing, nice and simple. And uh, yeah, look, we've, we've got some great new staff on board and more capacity. So uh, yeah, even if it's just for a chat, that's it. Just, that's just reach out. Well. Okay, nice one. Well, thank you. Thanks, Judy and everyone. Uh, remember to go and check these guys out, Rethink Investing. They're across all the social channels as well. We'll be back again next month. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>